So we're looking forward to great things in the Lord today. Those of you that didn't get here in time for me to pass you out a new Sunday school book before you leave here today, uh, we only have one size, and they start next Sunday. But I want to encourage you, those of you that, do, did, that did get a book and those of you that would like to have a book, I want you to get one. But each day of our less uh, of the week has a a daily devotion, and it, it's just there so that you can draw strength and and grow in your relationship with the Lord, and also your children. Those of you that have got young children, they're going to be studying from this same uh, God's Word for Life. They're, they'll be on the same uh, same lesson teaching. Well, they'll be on the children's level, but I'm just talking about the same lesson, and it's encouraging each family to have a daily devotion in your home, to grow closer as a family with the Word of God and prayer, and, and just just uh, uh, building that relationship with you and the Lord and your family and, and, and with them and the Lord. Folks, if we ever needed to draw closer, we need to draw closer in this day and hour we're living in to the Lord. You know, uh, it's not a time to, to, to be iffy about your relationship with the Lord. It, it's, it's serious times, and, and we, wanna, we want to just do everything we can, put whatever we can into your hands to help you along your way in serving the Lord. And so today is our last lesson in our series of, uh, of Standing in Faith, and we're looking at Lesson 13 today. It's called The Role of the Prophet and Prophecy. And I'm telling you, we, we have been taught the Word of God. Many of us have been taught the Word of God from our youth. Uh, we, we've known the Word of God to be true. And, and uh, if we ever have a, a love for truth, we need that love like never before. You know, a lot of people, they, they get excited about a lot of things. But we're living in a time we better get excited about what, what the things of God and what how, how our walk with God is. Uh, you know... A pastor and I were talking this morning how that we get, you know, when something goes wrong with our physical, we get concerned, and that's rightfully so. We should be concerned, but how much more concerned should we be about our spiritual man? Right. This old this old flesh is going to lay down one day and going to go back to the earth, but our spiritual, the spiritual man is going to live. That soul is going to live on and on. And if we ever got serious about where we're going to stay and be in eternity, we need to get serious about it. So we're looking at the fact that prophets speak on behalf of God today. Uh, there was a little story in my, my teacher's book. I, I'm not sure if it was in yours or not, but it just was a little introduction to what our lesson's all about. It said in 1901, well, that's been a day or two ago, has it not? 1901. The Ladies' Home Journal published an article by John Watkins, Jr., and it was titled, What May Happen in the Next 100 Years? Now, Mr. Watkins, uh, he didn't consult a psychic, and, uh, but instead he interviewed respected scientists and university professors. So he went to people that were knowledgeable of science and so forth, and some of their predictions, uh, it said, had a measure of accuracy, accuracy but... Others were laughably off base. And you're going to see that when I read some of those predictions today. Uh, there, this was some of their predictions. Nicaragua and Mexico would join the U.S. before 2001. That was one of their predictions. There would be no letters in the alphabet such as C, X, and Q in the next 100 years in the English alphabet. Uh, they also predicted that Russian, the language, the Russian language would be the second most spoken language in the world. Not. <laughs> we know what that is. Uh, and it's actually, according to the lesson said, it's actually the eighth, le uh, eighth language in the world. And then the prediction said there would be no more animals except in the zoos. <laughs> but now listen to this prediction. Rats and mice would be exterminated. Wrong. <laughs> They forgot about that on Holly Grove. <laughs> uh, so uh, these were things. Oh, and one more thing. Strawberries, raspberries, and blackberries would be as big as apples. Mm. Well, they had, a, they had a vivid imagination. I, I call it imagination. This was their prediction. But the truth is, here's the truth. God alone knows what tomorrow holds. Amen? Amen. And sometimes he tells people what will happen so they can inform others, and we call those people prophets. 
And I am so thankful for prophets, men and women of God, prophets and prophetess. So, so we're looking at prophets today. The first time uh, that we see that word prophet mentioned in the Bible will be in Genesis 20 and 7. And it's in reference to a man by the name of Abraham. Anybody ever heard of Abraham? Uh, and, and so we find here in this reading where that Abraham and, and Sarah had gone uh, into the land there where the king Abimelech was. And uh, he, Abraham told, had already told Sarah that when we go into, you know, into a foreign land, into a strange place, uh, I want you to tell them you're my sister, which in, F, in, in actuality she was. They had the same father but not the same mother. So they, that, was, that was what they told this king. And so when they got there, he just sees how beautiful a lady Sarah is, so he just takes Sarah for himself. But she was in actuality Abraham's wife. Genesis 27 says, Now therefore restore the Lord talking to King Abimelech in, in the night, in a, in, a, in a vision, a dream rather. He said, Now therefore restore the man his wife, for he is a prophet. And he shall pray for thee, and thou shalt live. And if thou restore her not, know thou that thou shalt surely die, thou and all that are in thine. So, so uh, reading from the verses here, we see uh, that a prophet is one that can pray, and their prayers are answered. And when I read that about the lesson in, in our lesson today, hey, I couldn't help but think about Elijah, the prophet Elijah. Remember, he prayed and shut up the heaven that there would be no rain. And for three and a half years, there was no rain upon the earth. Of course, there was a famine in the land, and, and God provided for the man of God. But all of Israel was in trouble. And why, would they, why was this happening to them? Because of sin. Right. And so God used the prophet Elijah. And, and then in three and a half years, Elijah prayed again. And guess what? God sent the rain. So we know that a prophet, one of the things that they do is they pray. And, and, and then they also get their prayers answered. And, you know, have you ever really thought about this? When I think about, back to Elijah, when I think about when, the, when his servant, when Elijah was praying, remember, remember, let, let me go back a little bit. And I know this is not in our lesson today, but somehow or another, I think it's important to say this. But if you'll remember the story of Elijah and why that God had shut up the heavens that there would be no rain and why God used this prophet of God, but God also used this prophet of God to prove to Israel that he was the one true God because they had gone out into idolatry. They had started worshiping Baal because King Ahab, who was Israel king, he had married, he had married a woman that was a Baal worshiper. That's why, and people don't listen to us, and, and some of us didn't listen, but when 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 we were growing up in church, we were taught you 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 marry someone that believes the the the, the truth of God's word. You don't go out into the world and just marry somebody that right. you have nothing in common with. You're going to want to live for God, and they're going to want to do worldly things, and that always brings a problem. And how did I get there? I don't know. But anyway, Ahab did that. He he went outside the, the children of Israel, and he married a foreign what we would call a foreigner, uh, someone that didn't believe in the one true God. And here she goes bringing that doctrine into him, and he swallows it hook, line, and right. sinker because that's his wife, and she's telling him, honey, I think we ought to be a Baal worshiper. So he becomes a Baal worshiper, but it cost the whole nation of Israel, right. and God sent judgment on them because of that. And so God used the prophet Elijah, and he said, let the God that answers by fire, let him be God. And so you know the story how that the prophets of Baal, they took a, a bullock, and, and they begin to cut that bullock, and they put it on an altar and they begin to cry oh Baal hear us. Well Baal can't hear them because he's a God they made. That's right. He had no authority. He had no power. Right. But but we know that how that they just kept calling on Baal and, and, and Elijah, he just couldn't help himself. He just had to give them just a little bit, you know. Oh, is your God off on a journey? Or, or you know, maybe, you know, he's here, he's there. Uh, you know, and, and they got so upset, they even cut themselves because they, they were so, uh, what can I say, so indoctrinated in false worship. You know, we're living in a world where there's so much false teaching in the land today. 
And so Elijah called the whole nation of Israel back to God because he, he knew the God that he served was the one true God. And, of course, he said, let the God that answered by fire be God. Now, now Baal worshipers, they couldn't put no fire under the, at their altar either. But when the man of God began to rebuild the altar after the worshipers of Baal had torn apart, he began to build it up just right. He put the 12 stones in orders representing the 12 tribes of Israel. And then he dug a trench about that altar. And he began to have them to pour water on the altar. Now, look, folks, if you're going to build a fire, you don't usually wet the wood. But he was proving the fact that his God had the power to send the fire and do what needed to be done because he had that. He was the true God. And, of course, after they poured four, uh, 12 bar barrels of water on the sacrifice, then Elijah began to pray. And remember what I said about a prophet? A prophet prays, and God hears and answers a prophet prayer. And so Elijah prayed, and God sent the fire down from heaven. It not only consumed the sacrifice, but it burned up everything, even it licked up the water that was in the trench around the sacrifices and everything that was there. It took it took in its uh, in in its uh, uh, it took coal upon it with the fire, the power of the fire. And what that's telling me is our God has got all power, and there's nothing my God cannot do. I don't care how difficult the situation may be. God's got a people, and God's going to honor the people that will pray and seek His face. God honored the prophet Elijah's prayer, and God sent the fire down. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. What he did for the prophets of old, he'll do for you and I today if we'll just trust in him. Amen. 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 So, so this prophet, uh, we see Abraham was known as, as a prophet. Uh, reading from that verse, we in, in Exodus 7 uh, and 1, we're going to look at that now. Uh, in our lesson text, we're given more specific insight as to what a prophet does. Let's look at Exodus 7 and 1. It says, And the Lord said unto Moses, See, I have made thee a god to Pharaoh, and Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet. Thou shalt speak all that I command thee, and Aaron thy brother shall speak unto Pharaoh, that he send the children of Israel out of his land. So this, this text here identifies a prophet here as a spokesman. And that are speaking for God. And throughout the scriptures, we see that a true, true prophet is a spokesman for God. They speak what words that God tells them to speak. And, and, and so, and those words are known as prophecies. And, and we know that God has true prophets because they are men who speak for God to others. And, and I'm so thankful to know that, you know, that, that God has got true men and women of God that are still speaking God's word. When Aaron and Miriam, that's that's Moses' brother and sister, uh, sometimes I, I get a little carried away and I just, I just I guess I put too much in, into what I, I but anyway, uh, Moses was 80 years old when this is taking place and his brother Aaron was 83 and Miriam was the older sibling of that bunch. But they begin to criticize uh, Moses, because he had married an Ethiopian woman, and they began to talk to their brother uh, uh, Moses about this, and they, it might have been what we would call some, maybe even sibling rivalry. Now, I know those of you that have raised children know what I'm talking about, but in, in Numbers 12 and 6, the Bible said, and he said, hear now my words, if there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, this is the Lord talking to, to them, those three. I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision and will speak unto him in a dream. My servant Moses is not so, who is faithful in all mine house. Now, God is telling how he, he speaks to prophets. It's through dreams and vision. But then he's talking about his servant Moses. He's kind of pulling Moses aside and putting him in a, in a category of his own. And the Lord said in verse 8, with him, talking about Moses, will I speak mouth to mouth, even apparently, and not in dark speeches. In other words, when I talk to my servant Moses, it's not going to be in visions and in, in dreams. No, no. I'm going to speak directly to no, him. No, that's right. And the similitude of the Lord shall he behold. That word means the form. Uh, the form of the Lord shall he behold. Wherefore, then were ye not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? 
Moses. He's asking Miriam and, and Aaron, why were you not afraid to speak to, to my servant the way you have spoken to him? Because Moses was a sp spoke person for God. And, and of course, Aaron was the spoke person for Moses. And Moses, he spoke God's word to a Aaron and, and then he, Aaron passed it on to Pharaoh. And this means that Moses was a prophet also because if you, if our scripture text says in Deuteronomy 18 and 15, the Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee of thy brother like unto me. Moses is saying this, unto him shall you hearken. He's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, of course. And right. then in verse 10 of Deuteronomy 34, he said, And there arose not a prophet, talking about Moses, since in Israel like unto Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. Not only was Moses a prophet, but God spoke again to Moses face to face. face. To face right. It was common for God to speak to prophets, as I said a while ago, in dreams and visions, but to Moses... He's, he, when, he, when God spoke to him, it wasn't through a dream, but God spoke directly to him. Right. And, and he used the word face to face, and, and he saw the form of the Lord. It, that doesn't mean that he saw God physically with his natural eyes, but when Moses asked to see God's glory, you know what the Lord told him? Yeah. In, in Exodus 33 and 19, he said, I will make all my goodness to pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy to whom I will show mercy. And then the Lord went on and said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock, and it shall come to pass while my glory passeth by, that I will put thee in a cliff of the rock, and will cover thee with my hand while I pass by, and I will take away my hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. Now, this is an awesome thing that God is doing just for Moses. Right. God was allowing his servant to see his glory, and, and uh, we are told through the word of God that God is a spirit, folks. God is a spirit in John 4, 21, and because of this, he is invisible, to the natural eye. But 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 we know that because God is a spirit, you can't see a spirit, but, but we know that God manifests himself, and he did, of course, He God was manifest in the flesh. Right. But, but let's look at Colossians 1 and 14. It says this about uh, that invisible God, in whom we have redemption, talking about Jesus, through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image. Yeah. Now look at that. Who is the image? That means a reproduction of the form of a person or the exact image. When you, uh, excuse me, the exact likeness. When you look into a mirror, what do you see? You right. see your what? Your image. Your, your image. And so in Colossians 1.15, he says, who is the image, talking about Jesus, of the invisible God, God the firstborn of every creature? So uh, Hebrews 11 and 27 also talked about him being invisible. It says, by faith, talking about Moses, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. That's how Moses was able to do the things he did. Now, can I just insert this in here? Because the Lord seemed like was talking to me yesterday about this. Uh, Moses was able to endure the things that he did because he saw him who is invisible. You know, you know, people can talk about other people and tell you how wonderful that person is, what a what a fine man or woman they are, and how faithful a person and how talented they are. And, and they just build up your curiosity and you think, man, I'd like to, I'd like to meet that person. You know, they sound like a, a wonderful person to know. But until you meet them face to face. All you know is what somebody has told you about them. That's right. And, and Moses, he had a relationship with God. It was more than just what somebody had told him. Right. By faith, the Bible said, by faith, he was able to leave Egypt. And by faith, 
He endured because he had that relationship. He saw him who is invisible. Folks, we have never seen the Lord, but we've got to do more than just hear what people tell us about our God. We've got to know him for ourselves. He's got to be my God. He's got to be my Savior, my Lord, my King, the one that I put my trust in, my Redeemer, my Healer, my Savior, my God. Mm, we've got to know him for ourselves. We've got to see him through spiritual eyes, the one that is invisible. Amen. Is that okay to say today? Yes. Yes. I'm telling you folks, I'm working on me. Oh I am, I, I'm working on me. Yeah. Well, you said, why are you working on you, Sister Creasy? You, you ought to be where you need to be or you shouldn't be up there. Honey, I believe it's just like we are in that we are in, we are the bride of Christ. Amen. And as the bride of Christ, we have got to keep ourselves unspotted from this world. That's what I'm talking about. That's right. I'm talking about keeping myself where I need to be with the Lord Jesus Christ. Because when he comes back after his church, he's not coming back after those that, that, uh, that, that have got sin in their life. That's right. There's nothing unclean going to enter him, yeah. the gates of glory. Right, but he's coming back after people that have made themselves ready, that are watching for his appearance. That every day they're growing and trying to get closer to him and working on that relationship, finding that time. Did I say finding? Yeah. Let, let me just change that to making that time. That time that you know that you just can't wait to get in the presence of the Lord. Right. Folks, the more you make time for him, the more you'll want to make time for him. Do you know every morning, Pastor and I make time to visit with each other before he gets on that school bus. That's right. It has meant that I have to change my habits. Right. I'm not a morning person per se, no, you're not. but I have learned to be. I was in bed last night before he went to bed. You know why? Because if I'm going to get up and, in fe and fellowship with him before he gets on that bus, I got to wake up early. Right. And the only way I can wake up early is go to bed early. I was in bed at 8 o'clock. I don't even think it was quite dark at 8 o'clock. But I was up this morning at 2.30. I've been up since 2.30. I'm awake. I'm becoming a morning person. Because I am You say, but you have been married 53 years. Can't you just forget about all that stuff? No. That's why we get married 53 years. No. Because I still enjoy when he puts his hand on my shoulder. Right. Or when I can lay my head over on his shoulder. You say, ah, oh, y'all are old fuddy does. We may be old fuddy does, but we still like to know that each other cares for each other. And that's the same way it is with God. If you don't ever enjoy the presence of the Lord and you don't still enjoy when he touches you or when you can lay your head on his shoulder, I'm telling you something's wrong. Amen. Something's wrong. You're right. You ain't working on that relationship. I, I'm going to be nice. That, that's, no, no, no. Go on free. Moses, no, Moses could not look directly at God with his natural eyes. But the goodness of God or God's glory. Ooh, when I say God's glory, it, just, it does something for me. God's glory was going to pass while Moses was hidden in a cliff. And, and that, that's nothing other than just a hangover of a, of a big rock. Uh, that would be his covering. And when Moses saw, what, what Moses saw was an awesome, was, was so awesome, though it was only the back parts of God. Mm. We could say that Moses saw, look at this, we could say, and be careful and be right when we say that, Moses saw the afterglow of where God's goodness had been. Oh, yeah, that's good, the afterglow. Do you know why people don't want to leave church when we've had one of those hallelujah, Holy Ghost, powerful, power-packed services? Because they're still feeling that afterglow of the presence of the Lord. And they don't want to leave that presence. Folks, there's nothing like the presence of God. Yeah. Ooh, hallelujah. 
You know, I, there's a lot of things in this world I've never even tried and never even wanted to try. But I'm going to tell you, I've tasted of the Lord, and I can tell you he's good. I'm telling you the presence of the Lord is nothing like anything this world has got to offer. And there's nothing out there that I want besides to indulge in God's presence. And no wonder Moses could endure. God had given him that special relationship. And I'm going to tell you, folks, that's how we're going to make it through the day and hour that we're living in. It's because we've got that relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. We have seen that invisible God, not with our natural eyes, but through the eyes of the spiritual man. So that word translated uh, glory, it refers to some kind of weighty and abundant splendor. No one who glimpsed this with the natural eye could survive. And to say God spoke to Moses face to face, it, 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 it's plain, plain. It, it, he, he spoke to him plainly. He didn't speak through visions and, 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 and dreams. You know, if you remember different prophets uh, wrote if you if you've read the, your Bible through and you read the prophecies of Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, you read those prophecies and I read them and I'm like, whoo! I wish I knew what all this meant. Yeah. I, I'm serious. I now some things I know, you know, I know plainly what it said, but some things I can't quite grasp. Well, well, that's that's those that's those uh, the word that's in, in the dark sayings or uh, you know that's not that's not something that you can really. But when God spoke to Moses uh, and he saw that form of the Lord, uh, he he had a he had that face to face uh, experience with God, and it was a way of explaining the clarity of the communication. In other words, because uh, he he understood exactly what God was saying to him. Now sometimes you can be talking to me. And I'm bad about this. Y'all don't do this. I understand. But sometimes somebody can be talking to me and I'm having this whoosh, thought run through my mind. Yeah. And then when they get through, I'm thinking, God, what was that? I missed something. I'm bad about letting thoughts run through my mind while somebody's, because I'm not listening. But I guarantee you, Moses, when God talked to him, nothing else was on his mind but what God, he didn't want to let one word drop from what God was telling him. And, 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 and we need, if we ever, I'm, I'm just going to put it on me, and y'all just listen to me, okay? Go ahead. Go ahead. But if we ever, as Pastor says, perked up our ears and started listening to what comes across this pulpit yes, through, through the Word of God, right. we need to start listening. Amen. And I know we're all human, and we have these thoughts that run through our mind. We're thinking about, you know, I, I, I hope, my, my big thing is lately, I hope I put the garage door down. I have turned around probably a mile from the house to go back and see. Did I? And I said, how can anybody be? So I try to think, okay, girl, when you push the button, wait till the door comes down so you don't have to get up the road and wander. You know, we have these thoughts that run through our mind. But, but if we ever listen to what God has got to say to us through his word, through the man of God, we need to hear. Uh, you, know, you know, children play, okay? Children, they, they want to have fun. They want to, they want to, you know, be, you know, just have a good time and all like this. And, and I can remember in church, I remember we had this, my pastor's mother, she was kind of like the, the patrol, the pat p police patrol in church. Yeah. You know, she would give you that look and you know, you better straighten up, you know. And, and then sometimes my sister, Sister Heron, she was older than me, she'd look at me, you know. You know, I did that wonder thing. I'm not doing nothing. But I, I can admit, as a kid in church, there was a lot of times I wasn't paying attention because there was other things on my mind. But I'm telling you, it's time we grow up in the house of God and get serious about what, what we're hearing. Because this is the saving of our soul, folks. It's not just a time to we, you say, well, I showed up so pastor won't be calling me wondering where I was at. I'm, I was there at church. I made my parent. No, no. You're here for a reason, and that's that the word of God can get embedded in our heart. Brother Mark, I got your scripture wherever you're at. I got your scripture on the sign out there. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Folks, this word of God, when it comes across the pulpit, we got to get it down inside of us. It's not just a fairy tale, but it's what's going to keep us in the day and hour that we're living in. We're living in perilous times, folks. It's time to sound the alarm. Trouble. Amen. Yes, ma'am. So, so, so we, we, it, it, so God is, is speaking to Moses face to face, 
And, and it was a way of explaining the clarity of the communication. And the word, that word form refers to when his, when his glory passed by. Whatever represented the presence of the Lord. But it wasn't tangible or physically visible image. But it was the presence of God. And folks, I, I, I just believe, you know, I, I may be a little, you may think I'm a little whatever. But I believe sinners, people that don't even claim to be Christians, I believe they can tell when the presence of God is in a service or when it's just people right. going through emotion. Right. If they couldn't, they'd never come to an altar and pray. Because it takes the Spirit of God to draw them. So one reason perhaps for this is that Moses was called to write scripture. That's, that could be why that God spoke to him face to face. Other prophets wrote as well, but uh, they, they, they had visions and dreams, some of them, but they, they didn't fully comprehend the meaning of all that they wrote. But, but Moses was to, to put down the word of God uh, you know, for others to read. And Paul wrote to the church at Rome about the mystery of Christ being revealed. Uh, in Romans 16, 25, it says, Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began, but now, but now is made manifest. What's made manifest? The, the revelation of the mighty God in Christ Jesus. That's but right. now is made manifest, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations, for the obedience of faith. At one time, all they knew back then was, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called. This was Isaiah prophesying, 9 and 6. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. They heard about it all their life, but we know who that was. Amen. It was none other than Jesus Christ, the Mighty God in Christ. And so Paul is telling us these things. And then in Colossians 2, 7 and 10, it says, But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. I'm sorry, I didn't give you time to pull it up there. Did I not put it down? Ooh. Colossians 2, 2 and 7. That's it? Okay. Okay. Then guess what? I wrote it down wrong. Oh, my goodness. Where's my Bible? I have a little Bible. Bible, Bible, Bible. Which one are you looking for? But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. There it is. Okay. First Corinthians. Ah, First Corinthians two seven. I've got Colossians two seven. That's why you got Colossians two seven. But let's look at that. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Even the hidden hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. Verse eight. Which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it. They would not have crucified the Lord of glory, verse 9. But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him, verse 10. But God, I love that, but God hath revealed them unto us. How? By his spirit. Folks, we get the revelation and the understanding of the word of God by, because it is revealed unto us by the Spirit of God. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. And folks, if you're going to understand the Word of God, it's going to come to your understanding by a revelation of the Spirit of God. You've got to have the Spirit of God in you so right. that you can receive that right. Word of God, that it can be revealed to you. That's why it's so important. You know, you got to have that Spirit dwelling on the inside of, of you. So God's revealed it unto them by His Spirit. So uh, and then in, in Ephesians 3 and 3 it says, How that by revelation He made known unto us the mystery as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy 
apostles and prophets. How? By the Spirit. The things that they didn't understand back in the Old Testament, we understand today because we have the Spirit of the living God living on inside of us. When did that happen? When we were filled with the Spirit of God. Hebrews 1 and 1 says, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. They, They got their word by the prophets back in the olden days. But verse 2 says, Hath in these last days spoken unto us by who? By his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. So we see here how that God has revealed himself to us by his Son. Right. And, and so Paul, went, uh, Paul wrote to Timothy, I believe, is, in, is it 1 Timothy 3.16? Right. Great is the mystery of godliness. Without controversy, I always get that one. Forget that one. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. What is that mystery? God was what? Manifest in the flesh. How how did that happen? Jesus Christ, when he came to this earth. Justified in the what? The spirit. Seen of angels. Preached unto the Gentiles. Believed on in the world. Received up into glory. That is the mystery that we're talking about today. And we're talking about how that God spoke to him in olden times by the prophets, but now he speaks to us by his son, and uh, whom he hath appointed heirs of all things. So, so we're learning today that a true prophet is called of God. And we see, uh, for example, we see that calling was when he called Elijah. Oh, excuse me, when he called Elisha. How did he do it? He spoke first to Elijah. God, God told Elijah, he said, Elisha, the son of Shaphat, is the one you're going to anoint to be prophet in your, in your place or in your room. And then what about when he called Isaiah? Uh, God called Isaiah. You see, a, a prophet don't just say, well, I think I'm going to be a prophet of God. No, that ain't how it works. A prophet is a, a true prophet is called of God. Uh, 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 Isaiah, uh, when, when God began to speak to him, what, how did he respond? He said, here am I, send me. And, and God began to tell him, you go tell the people uh, thus and thus and thus. And then there was the prophet Amos, uh, how he was called. He said this about himself. He said, I was no prophet, neither was I a prophet's son, but I was a herdman and a gatherer of sycamore fruit. And the Lord, the Lord took me as I followed the flock, and the Lord said unto me, Go prophesy unto my people Israel. And, and then we see how that the Lord called Jeremiah. Uh, you, you, you can't forget how the Lord spoke to Jeremiah. He said, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. That's right. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee and I ordained. That means he I appointed. He said, I ordained thee a prophet unto the nation. And, and then, of course, there was Ezekiel uh, who, who saw that breathtaking vision of the glory of God and the Spirit entered to him. And the Lord said, uh, the Lord said, Son of man, I send thee to the children of Israel, to a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me even unto this very day. So all of these prophets were God called and appointed to be a prophet. Right. But in the New Testament, uh, prophets are among the gifts that God gives to the church. Did you realize that? Right. In Ephesians 4 and 11, it says these words, And he gave some apostles and some prophets. Notice that he gave that to the church, and then he talked about evangelists, pastors, and teachers. For what? For the perfecting of the saints. Folks, we, that's why I said we've got to listen to what God is speaking to us through the men and women of God. It's, for, it's so that we can be perfected, and also for the work of the ministry, and for the edifying of the body of Christ. And that word edify means to build up. Folks, when, when we leave here, if we if we collectively have got uh, serving God on our mind, we're going to leave here built up because the word of God is going to strengthen us. It's going to encourage us. It's going to give us what we need to make it through the week. And so it comes through the ministry, through the apostles, prophets. That's the one we're focusing in on today, through evangelists, through pastors and teachers. Can I say this? And you may not like me anymore when I say this, and that's okay, but I'm going to tell it because I believe it's right. The Bible said that he put this five-fold ministry into the church for the perfecting of the saints, work of the ministry, edifying of the body of Christ. Do you know there's people that won't come unless their favorite preacher's in the pulpit? Right. That's a shame, too. They're bypassing what God put into the church. That's right. 
He put the ministry, the five-fold ministry. Evangelists has their place. Right. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, right. pastors, teachers, they all have their place. Right. But if we, we say, well, I only like Brother Creasy because he's my pastor, then we're disannulling the other ministry that God has put into That's the right. body right. of Christ to, to be edified and to be built up and to be taught the word of God. We're just pushing all that away. It's just like, like some of us. If we, when I was a kid, I didn't like anything green, pretty much. Turnip greens, spinach, ugh, tomatoes. But you put it on my plate today. I have an appetite for every bit of that. You don't have to. But, but as a kid, I just kind of push it on, push it on that. I wouldn't even try it. It just didn't appeal to my eye. And that's what people are doing with the ministry. They're just pushing it because that's not my preacher up there. Well, you're telling me, right? Woo! Do I get a raise? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Two biscuits is going to win. Okay. So, <laughs> oh. so, so uh, we're looking here at 1 Corinthians 12 and 28. We're talking about how the prophets are among the gifts that God gives the church. And God has set some in the church. First, apostles. And look what secondarily. Prophets. Prophets. That, that uh, prophets. Thirdly, teachers. After that, miracles. Then gifts of healing, helps, governments, diversity of tongues. So all of these are in there that God has put in there as a gift he's given to us, the church. And so we shouldn't push aside any ministry that God has given us. Amen. There are, there are also women in the ministry that perform as they do the work as a prophet does, and they are known as prophetess. That's right. Uh, do you know that Moses' sister Miriam was a prophetess? How about Deborah? Not only was she a judge, she was a prophetess. And there was Huldah, who was a prophetess. Noah Dyer was a prophetess. And then in Isaiah 8 and 13, Isaiah's wife was also known as a prophetess. So, so that was in the Old Testament. How about the New Testament, Sister Crazy? Are there, are there New Testament prophetess? Look at Luke 2, 36. The Bible says, And there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Acer. She was of a great age and had lived with her husband seven years from her virginity. And those of you that are familiar with that scripture, she was there in the temple when they brought Jesus uh, to be uh, dedicated That's there right. at, at the time that they brought all the male children at a certain age. And she was there. And, and also there was, um, oh, Lord, I forgot the man's name. Who's the, the man? The, the guy, uh, the, the servant who brought from mine, I haven't seen him there anymore. Was it An An Anna? Anna? No, what's the name? Simeon. Simeon, that's it. For some reason, it just wouldn't come through here. Uh, so Don't it's reasonable feel. to us to assume that all <laughs> prophets and prophetesses would be gifted to prophesy, but not, look at this, but not all who prophesy are prophets. Did you know that? Here's the, here's the thing. A prophet is a person who fills a specific role in the church, but prophecy is a gift, not a person, that God gives to some people as he does the rest of the gifts of the Spirit. You'll find in Romans 12 and 6 these words, having then gifts differ, differing according to the grace that is given unto us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. So here we see uh, the, word, the word prophesying or prophecy uh, not uh, attached to a prophet. And how about Philip's four daughters? You remember in, in Acts 21 and 8, it says, And the next day we that were of Paul's company departed and came unto Caesarea, and we entered into the house of Philip the Evangelist, which was one of the seven, that means the seven deacons, and abode with him. And the same man had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. So uh, the four daughters of Philip aren't identified as prophetesses, so it may be that they simply had that gift of prophecy and these gifts describe uh, functions and not persons when we're talking about prophecy. Uh, but to have true prophets, guess what? There's going to be false prophets. And I know I've got to hurry. I don't have much time. Uh, a false prophet has the tendency. Are you ready for this? Are you ready for this? Yeah. We've talked about the true prophecy. We're talking about false prophets now. A false prophet has the tendency, 
listen to me, to tell people what they want to hear. Did y'all get that, that little yeah, tidbit? Mm -hmm. They tell people what they want to hear. Having itching ears, you know. Tell me what I, what I want to hear. Not what, what's true. Tell me what makes me feel good. What makes me feel like, oh, you're, doing, you're a pretty good old girl. You're doing pretty good. No. Tell me the truth. Tell me the truth. Tell me what I've got to do to make it to glory. Don't tell me what I want to hear. Tell me what I need to hear. What I must hear. So during the days of Jeremiah, the prophet of God, there were false prophets that claimed to be speaking for God. They were telling the people before the invasion of Babylon, Jeremiah's telling the truth, and he's saying, you're going to be overcome, you know, you're going to be taken captive, and here's these false prophets, and, and, and they're telling this, that there would be peace, there wouldn't be any famine, but I'm going to tell you, the Lord told Jeremiah, his true prophet, these words in Jeremiah 14 and 14, then the Lord said unto me, the prophets prophesy lies in my name. I sent them not, neither have I commanded them, neither spake unto them. They prophesy unto you a false vision and divination and a thing of naught and the deceit of their heart. And I want, I want to stop right there on that deceit of their heart. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, if we don't receive a love of the truth, we can be deceived. I'm going to read it to you from the Word of God. You want me to prove that? Yeah, go ahead. Jesus warned about false prophets, and he explained they could be known by their fruit. Look at this in Matthew 7, 15. Jesus said these words. Beware. Have you ever seen a sign in people's yard that says, Beware of the dog? That means you better look out. There's a, there's a vicious dog around. Or, or that's what it's supposed to mean. Beware. The signs, I, I'm putting the sign in the window, folks. I'm, I'm stapling the sign in the, in the, on the pulpit today. Beware of false prophets. I'm telling you, beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them how? By their fruits. Do men, he, the Lord asks the question, do men gather grapes of thorns? Why not? When you pick grapes, you don't get pricked with a thorn like you do a rose bush. Right. Or figs of thistles? No, no, the answer's no. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. And the Lord went on to say about these false prophets in Matthew 24 and 11. He said, and many, everybody say many. many. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. many. In verse 24 of Matthew 24 said, Jesus talking again. For there shall arise, this is talking about the last days, folks. And for there shall arise false Christ and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders in so much. That if it were possible, if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Who are the elect? God's chosen ones. It would cause them to believe a lie and be damned. I'm telling you, if you don't pick up the word of God and get it down inside of you, then the end, you are open season for whatever the enemy wants to throw at you. Amen. Mark 13 and 22, Jesus went on to say this. In the last, he's talking about the last day. For false Christ and false prophets shall rise and shall show signs and wonders to seduce. And that word seduce means to persuade, to disobedient, or to be disloyal. It also means to lure. That word seduce means to lure. If it were possible, even the elect... I'm telling you, that's how close it comes to being a deceptive spirit. We better understand what truth is. We better love truth. And we better desire it more than we do our natural food. Right. Amen. 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 So we can compare what's taught in the scripture to detect falsehood. The apostle Peter said it like this. In, in 2 Peter 2 and 1 says, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies. That means doctrine contrary to truth. That's what, that's what those heresies are. Even denying the Lord that, that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many... And many, there's that word again, and many, say many with me, many, many, many shall follow their pernicious, and that means wicked, ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil. If we have ever lived in a time this is coming to pass, we're living in a time when people are following their wicked ways and the way of truth is being called evil. Right, right. Amen, amen. 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 Verse 3 says, and through covetousness.
righteousness shall they with feigned, and that word means not genuine or real, shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. Folks, there's coming a judgment day for those false prophets. But I'm telling you, we that know the true God, we better get knowledgeable of what is true in this Amen. day and hour. Amen. These false teachers are characterized by covetousness. And covetousness means in or, in or, inordinate desire for wealth or possessions. Yes, I'm telling you, there's people that they're not out for you to save your soul. They're out for what they can get from you. Right. right. Amen. If it means patting you on the back and making their, their wallets fat, they'll pat you on the back. All they're wanting is what they can get from you. Yes, but I'm yes. telling you, it's time yes. that we lay aside every weight and be sin that does so easily. Say, keep your eyes on Jesus. When the storms of life of trouble around you roll, keep your eyes on Jesus. Oh, and I can't even remember the rest of it. It's been so long, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm apt to sing it today at night. I, we got, we got to get our eyes on the right one. We got our eyes on everything that's going on in this world, and we ain't got our eyes on the one that's able to take us through this. Right. Mm, Jesus, man. In John 1, I'm sorry, in 1 John 4, 1 through 3, we read about spirits behind false teaching. Uh, John said, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby, here's how you're going to know, in other words, uh, hereby know you the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is coming in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is coming in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. Folks, we're living in a time when people are denying the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. They deny that he came in the flesh. But I want to tell you, we that do know our God, Daniel said, shall be strong and do what exploits. It's time we know our God. It's time we get acquainted with him more so than just a no so, a hope so salvation. But we better have a no so salvation. We better know today where we stand with God. Amen. If you're putting off serving the Lord, you better quit it. Amen. And I don't have much time left either. I got two <laughs> That was timely, wasn't it? <laughs> oh, Lord. Prophecy. Old Testament. My Lord. My Lord. I've got page 8, page 9. Let me turn over to page 10. Let me turn over to page 11. Folks, I had 11 pages. I want to read Deuteronomy before I conclude. 18 and 15. The Lord said, The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee. He's talking to Moses. Or Moses, excuse me, Moses is talking to the people about the Lord. The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me, unto him ye shall hearken. Who's he talking about? Jesus Christ. According to all that thou desirest of the Lord thy God in horror in the day of the assembly saying, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, neither let me see this great fire anymore, that I die not. And the Lord said unto me, they have well spoken that which they have spoken. I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren like unto thee, and will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. And it shall come to pass, pastor says that's a positive traction, that whosoever will not hearken unto my words which he shall speak, in my name, I will require it of him. People are still looking for this prophet, but I'm telling you, he came as a little babe in a manger. Hallelujah. He came to this world. He came to his own, and his own received him not. 
not, but to as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Folks, if we ever put our trust and confidence in God, we better put our trust and confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ today. Hallelujah. When Jesus fed the 5,000, some observed this miracle, and some of them said, John 6, 14 said, this is of a truth that the this is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. And they were right. His words were God's word. He was God manifest in the flesh. He was that prophet that was to come. He brought to you and me eternal life through the blood that he shed at Calvary. No greater love was ever shown. No greater man was ever known than Jesus. This lowly Nazarene, although he never had great fame, there's power, there's cleansing power in his dear name. He's my Savior, and I hope you know him too. If you don't know Jesus Christ in the power of the Holy Ghost today, before you leave this house, I pray that you will repent of your sins. Be water baptized in the lovely name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sin, and then you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promises unto you, to your children, and to all that are far off, even to as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words that he testified, he exhort, saying, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in breaking of bread Woo. and in fellowship. Oh, God. If we ever needed to understand who Jesus is, we need to know who Jesus is in this day and hour. God bless you. Give Jesus a hand.